Hi, I've been teaching at the University of Connecticut since about 1980. I have very large classes ranging in size from about 140 to 300, uh, a little more than 300. Actually, I've had as many as 700. So I do use primarily a lecture format, but I try to avoid some of the pitfalls that students that have responded to Jeffrey Young's question in the Chronicle for Higher Education about why lectures may fail I've tried to um, uh, replace the use of a lot of bulleted text with multimedia. Starting out with PowerPoint in the 1990s, and I've switched over to Apple Keynote around 2006. So, what I want to do is just show a couple examples of what it is I'm talking about. PowerPoint karaoke is what, unfortunately, so many professors use, and, of course, what students complain about, and rightly so. PowerPoint karaoke is simply where a professor will read from his or her PowerPoint screen, sometimes even turning his or her back from the class to read the screen. Very, very, very boring. And of course, it totally disengages students. They'll go to sleep. Um, this one here must be an honor student because he knew to bring a pillow to class. In other words, it's a very, very bad thing in terms of promoting engagement and learning. So, what I've been trying to do via workshops that I've been giving uh, to faculty is to add, consider doing an alternative. So, what I do is create my lectures from first-hand journal articles, but that doesn't matter. You can use any kind of source that you like, even if it's a textbook. But here's an example of what I actually do. This is an article from Science on Carotenoids and Sexual Attractiveness in Zebra Finches. So the first thing that I often do, depending on the complexity of the article, is actually sketch out some notes, do some crude storyboards. And in fact, this, these are the notes from the example that I'm going to show you right now. Then I use the storyboards to go to Keynote as, guess what, bulleted text. Now here is what most professors would end up showing in class. I would never show something like this in class. I just use it as a basis for going from this to the type of multimedia presentation that I do show in class. So here's what I end up showing in class via Apple Keynote. So carotenoids are chemicals that we get from our diet and um, they give color to various types of objects, to feathers, to lobster shells, to birds' beaks. And in this particular study, um, the authors were investigating the role of carotenoids in mate choice in zebra finches. So here's a male zebra finch. And what they did was to take brothers from the same next nest box to control for familial effects. Of course, they had a normal food diet of seeds and, and the like. Now, some of the uh, males were given uh, just the usual water in addition to the food. Others had water with added carotenoids in the water, additional to their food diet. And then they waited about a month to see what happened. And they got a predictable result. The males with the added carotenoids, indeed, had developed redder beaks than those without the carotenoids. Okay, that was pretty much expected. But what was really important in this study, well, actually one of two things, is that in birds, females choose who they're going to mate with when they're courted by a bunch of males. So they asked the females when given a choice between two males like you see here, they asked them this question. In other words, who do you want to mate with? And it turns out that when given this choice, females prefer to mate with the males that have the redder beak. In other words, the ones that have had the added carotenoids in their diet. Well, the authors went on one further step, a very important one, by injecting a protein into these males that interfered with their immune system. And it turns out that the, fe that the uh, males with the paler beak became rather unhealthy. They became ill, they had a poor immune response. But the ones with the redder beak actually remained pretty healthy. So the net result of all this is that the females ended up with healthier mates simply by preferring to mate with the ones with the redder beak. 
So that's what this article was all about, and that's how I go about presenting it in class. Let me just give one more example. Uh, I talk about the action of drugs in my nervous, nervous system section of my general psychology class. Okay, I could show it like this with bulleted text, but again, I don't. I talk about drugs acting as agonists or as antagonists. So I don't show it like this. Instead, I show it like this. So a neurotransmitter has its effect by locking into a receptor site causing it to fire, assuming it's an excitatory neurotransmitter. An agonist is a drug that mimics the action of a neurotransmitter, does exactly the same thing. An antagonist is a drug that blocks the action of a neurotransmitter, so when the neurotransmitter tries to lock into the receptor site, it can't do that. It has no effect. So, one of the many neurotransmitters in the brain is something called glutamate. It's involved hugely in learning and memory, especially in its location in the hippocampus in the brain. So typically, here's what would happen. We have uh, the presynaptic area of the, um, uh, of the synapse, presynaptic area. There's glutamate right there inside of the synaptic vesicle, ready to be released across the cleft and lock into the NMDA receptor, which is specific to glutamate. And so it will do that, and it will now bring the action potential across to the postsynaptic receptor site. Great. It does its job. What if you've been drinking alcohol? Well, it turns out that alcohol is an antagonist to glutamate. So it blocks the NMDA receptor, so glutamate cannot lock into that site and get the message across. Okay, so that's how I present that example in class. So do lectures fail? Well, I think many times they do, but I often think that that's due to the inappropriate use of PowerPoint, Keynote, or whatever type of presentation software a professor happens to be use, using. So I strongly encourage that we rethink how we're going about doing this for those of us that really do use the lecture style and might not want to explore other alternatives. Um, not that those other alternatives are bad. Some of them are really, really good and interesting. But for those of us that prefer lecturing, hey, let's lose all those bits of bulleted text and use more multimedia.